I'm going to, by way of introduction, I'm going to talk about the first posuk of Parashas Toldos. I have a particular style um, of giving a shear. I don't just like to talk about what the Mepharshim say, although that's hugely interesting. And we're going to see why it's interesting. But I like to understand why the Mepharshim feel the need. Why do the commentaries feel the need to comment? Because if the Torah was given to us and it makes perfect sense, why add anything to it? Just give us the words of the Torah and that should be sufficient. You know, I told a great story last week, and it was published in a, a Jewish newspaper in Los Angeles, the Jewish Journal. I took a group of 30 pastors together with a bishop to Israel. They're all great supporters of Israel. Did you know that the evangelical church, of which there are 60 million members in the United States, are huge supporters of Israel. They live in a kind of parallel universe to the Jewish community, in more than one respect. Uh, we tend to only mix among people who are supporters of Israel. There's plenty of people in the Jewish community who are not supporters of Israel, right? In the evangelical church, it's wall to wall. I've spoken in churches from Buffalo to uh, uh, Los Angeles and everywhere in between. I was once um, in a place in Alabama, I spoke in a church, and this place in Alabama is where they manufacture the rockets for the Iron Dome. Can you imagine such a thing? There's no Jews living there. It's only evangelicals. And I came into a church, there was three, 4,000 people in the church, and they sang Hatikva, and they were waving Israeli flags, and they sang Havanagila, and they sheves achim gam yochad. Like, go figure. Go and even figure, what is that all about? And there they are, supporting Israel. Try and get three or 4,000 Jews to come out on a Sunday afternoon and wave an Israeli flag. I don't think it's so easy. So 30 pastors come with me to Israel. And I sent a list to the bishop. I asked him, if there's any place that I can help you visit together with these pastors while we are in Israel, just tell me what those places are and I'll make the arrangements. And I gave a list of 10 places where I thought I could open a door to help bring these pastors to understand Israel. Do you have to understand? Every pastor here is the pastor of a church or in a church of no less than a thousand members. You're listening to that? No less than a 1,000 members. Some of them up to 50,000 members. So they go home and they talk about Israel. And then they bring groups to Israel. And those groups bring groups to Israel. And they support Israel. The support, by the way, financially, that's one thing. They make sure that Congress and the Senate votes for the financial support, what's called in Israel, the US, in America, the U.S.-Israel relationship. The fact that all this military support happens for Israel is because the United States has so many evangelical Christians who vote and who won't elect representatives who don't support Israel. Okay. I sent a list of 10 places. I don't know. I said, you want to visit uh, Natan Sharansky at the Jewish Agency. He was then the head of the Jewish Agency. I had various members of Knesset I knew. I said, would you like to visit them? Would you like to visit a particular museum, which I recommended? One of the things on the list, it was about a 10 or 12 names on the list, was Miri Yeshiva. Wow. Ten minutes later, the bishop phones me up. We've been through the list. There's only one place that we're interested in visiting, Miri Yeshiva. This was, this was not a phone call that was going to be easy to make. I phoned up one of the Rosh Hashivas, who happens to be related to me, which is no great Chiddush in my family. And I said, Rosh Hashiva, I hope you're sitting down. Because I'd like 
to bring a group of pastors to visit <laughs> Miri Yeshiva. <laughs> he said, Penny, are you serious? I said, I'm serious. He said, well, I am sitting down. A very long pause. He said, I cannot officially endorse such a visit, but I'm, because it's you, I'm not going to tell you not to do it. And I'm going to tell you when to go so that you're going to make the least possible noise and hopefully nothing will happen. Okay? <laughs> it's in the middle of Meir Sha'arim, right? Mm. So I said, um, where should I go? He says, go to the Beis Yeshaya building. The Beis Yeshaya building is one of the main buildings of the, where the Beis Medrash is. Go to the fourth floor. That's where the Chutznikim sit. Go there after 10 o'clock at night. Then the Bismedrish is not going to be packed. No one's hanging around on the street. Really? A mesh or him? Okay. And you should be okay. So we all piled into taxis from what was formerly known as the Larom Hotel. It's now called something else. And we went to Mir Yeshiva. Ten taxis or whatever it was. We all come out. These are Hispanics, blacks, pastors from the deep south who sound like they come out of a cowboy movie. And they come out of the cab. They're all wearing different... Every, all of them had bought themselves a yarmulke during the day so that they could go to visit the rabbi's yeshiva. By the way, they don't call me the rabbi. They call me the Jewish rabbi. It's like one word, the Jewish rabbi. So I said, come up. I don't know what, what, what's going to happen. <laughs> so we walk up four flights of stairs and walk into the Bes Medrash. And it's half empty. The light's all on. There's a bunch of Bachrim learning. I walk in and behind me, you know, coming in behind me, are all these pastors. The Bes Medrash went dead quiet. <laughs> so you know I'm not shy. I said, it's Pinny, I'm Pinny. So a few people who were there from London came up to me. I said, who are these people? So I said, Chavra, come over, I want to make an introduction. Come, come. So they come to the front, to the door, the back, I guess. And I said, I want to introduce you. These are my friends. They're great supporters of Israel. The evangelical Christians, and all of them are pastors in churches across the United States, and some of them in South America. Oh, really? So I said, what I'd like you to do, Hevra, is I'd like you to tell them what it means to be in yeshiva. You're not going to be here for very long, but for a few minutes, just tell them what it means for you to come here as boys from the United States, from Canada, from England, from South Africa... Australia, they were all English-speaking boys. Just tell them what it means to be a boy who comes to study in Miri Shiva in Yerushalayim. So they broke off into groups. And in one group, I, I was kind of leading the group. I picked up a Gemara. They were learning uh, a Gemara Baba Kama. And I went to the first page. I explained to the pastors, together with other Bochrim, I said to the Bochrim, tell them what's on this side of the page. Tell them what's on that. What's the difference between Rashi and Tosfus? Why are you studying this? Why can't you study Torah? You're going to hear something unbelievable now. We weren't there for a few minutes. We were there till well after midnight. And eventually, I said, okay, guys, we've got to go. These guys have got to go to sleep because they need to get up for Shachris. They're going to learn tomorrow again for 16 hours. So you've got to leave. And we headed towards the door, and I'm walking down the stairs, together with, I'm not going to say his name, although he's told the story before in his church. A, a major church in Southern California, with 18,000 members. Every single Sunday, between 15 and 20,000 people come to this church. Okay? I said to him, I don't want to hear the editorial. I'd like to hear the headline. What did you get out of coming to visit Mir Yeshiva? He said, Rabbi, for the first time in my life, I met Jesus. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> that wasn't a headline I hoped would be published in the Jewish Tribune. I said, what are you talking about? He said something absolutely remarkable to me, and then we're going to come back to the point that I started with. He said, we're taught in seminary that whatever it says in the gospel, that's it. Can't argue with the gospel. We know that because there's an English expression, gospel, truth. Whatever it says in the gospel, that's what it is. What happens if there's something in the gospel that doesn't make sense? There's contradictions in the New Testament. You don't argue. You don't have to think about it. That's not your problem. What you have to do is you have to come Sunday to church. You have to pick a piece of gospel. Find some moral message in that piece of gospel in the New Testament. Give a sermon. Inspire. And that's it. It's always puzzled me. Because whenever you look through the New Testament, you discover that Jesus doesn't stop arguing. Whenever he comes up against something that he doesn't like, he argues, he debates, he challenges. How does that reconcile itself with the fact that we're taught in seminary that we're not allowed to argue and debate and challenge? I came here tonight, and you introduced me to Moshe and Yankel. Moshe's from Lakewood, New Jersey, and Yankel's from Toronto, Canada. And you told them, as you told everybody, that they need to explain what they're doing here in Yeshiva. So they explained that they come from wherever they live in the world to study Torah in the center of Jewish life, which is the land of Israel. It didn't take them too long, two or three minutes, and then they said, and what are you doing here? So I told them, I'm a lover of Israel. Really? Why are you a lover of Israel? Because it talks about Israel in the Bible. But you don't believe in the Bible. Yes, we do. We believe in the New Testament. Yes, but the bit about the Israel, the land of Israel being the promised land, is in the Old Testament. You don't believe in the Old Testament. No, no. We do believe in that part of the Old Testament. There's other parts which have been modified for Christianity. Why would you modify one part and not the other? Why is it okay to believe that Israel is the promised land, but not to believe that you're forbidden to eat pork? Suddenly I was there defending my faith. I was being challenged for my belief system. I suddenly had to engage my brain. Suddenly I realized that Jesus learned in Mir Yeshiva. Because every time he met someone like me, he challenged them. Rabbi, tonight for the first time, I met Jesus. Jesus was a rabbi just like you. That's what he told me. Now... It's a cute story. He went back and said it to his church. His church has since led, I don't know how many groups, definitely more than a dozen groups to Israel. And they continue to support Israel. His only regret is that without me, he can't get into Mary Yeshiva. <laughs> the reason I'm telling you this is because the Mepharshim, beginning with Chazal, challenged the Torah. Whenever they came across something that didn't make sense, they challenged it. They were aware of it. They were conscious of it. And they didn't just let it go. No such thing as just letting something go. As just saying, well, it's there. I'll draw the moral lesson out of it. And that's it. It's there. I need to understand it. We're going to have an example right here at the beginning of Parshas told us. Because it says, it says in Parshas told us, Ba'ela told us Yitzchok ben Avram, these are the children of Yitzchok ben Avram, Avraham hoilit es Yitzchok. Avraham gave birth or had Yitzchok. One second, didn't we just say that Yitzchok is ben Avraham? So why do you need to say Avraham hoilit es Yitzchok? The Torah is not in the habit of repeating itself. Rabbis, when they give droshes, are in the habit of repeating themselves. Mm -hmm. The Torah is not in the habit of repeating itself. 
So why is the Torah repeating itself? Why does it need to add these words? So you're going to think, okay, it's a good question. It's not that important. Who cares? It repeats itself. It matters. Do you know why? Because in halachic material, whenever we have a non-narrative section of the Torah, and there's something repeated or an extra word or even an extra letter, we derive from that information, from that extra letter or word, laws that affect our lives. Now don't tell me that that only applies to halachic information. It must apply to narrative information as well. Now sometimes we know what the answer is. Sometimes we don't. In the 19th century... They began a process that was known as Bible criticism. Bible criticism means that those who were conscious and aware of all the different sections of the Torah that seemed to be repetitions or very similar to each other, had different authors. And for them, this was a great chiddush for Wellhausen. It was a huge chiddush that he came up with. You hear what I came up with? I must be a genius. I came up with the fact that the Torah repeats itself. No, you're not a genius. Because Chazal, 2,000 years ago, were very conscious of the fact that the Torah repeats itself. And as far as they were concerned, if there was a reason, if there was a purpose in that repetition, they coaxed it out. Now, I don't want to tell you that in every situation they coaxed out meaning. You know, we've just learnt the uh, portion of Bereshis, the Genesis uh, creation narrative is very tough. It's 31 psukim, in which we have to derive everything that we know about the science of creation. 31 psukim. I think I can quite easily say that uh, there's 31 million words that have been written about creation. Forget 31 psukim. So, how are we meant to derive all this information? So, if you are Kabbalist, take the Zohar and the first huge section of the Zohar deals with the Kabbalistic explanations for creation. And for every single word and letter, there's different meanings and understandings. If you're a rationalist, take the Mer Nevuchim, the guide to the, for the perplexed, written by Maimonides, and you'll find that he deals with this from a rationalist scientific perspective. Ultimately, they are conscious of the fact that this is a complex piece of material that's been condensed into 31 psukim. I'm not going to go into that. It's not Parshas Bereshis. Baruch Hashem, you didn't invite me here for Parshas Bereshis. The Parshas told us we have this first posuk. Yitzchok ben Avram. Avram hoyli des Yitzchok. So what does Rashi say? Rashi quotes a famous chazal. You're going to see that Rashi quotes a chazal that actually is not intuitive. Not that it's not intuitive in the answer that you get, but the source of this Chazal, where the Chazal actually comes from, is not talking about this question at all. But this is the way Rashi answers. I'm going to read you the English translation, which I have so helpfully included. As a result of the fact that the Posuk wrote Yitzchak ben Avram, it felt compelled to say that Avraham hoilid es Yitzchak. Because... What about the Leitzone Hadoir? Who are the Leitzone Hadoir? Leitzone Hadoir are people who make fun of everything. They are the cynical comedians. We're going to use the word scoffers. It's not a word that we use generally in conversation. It's just one simple word that we can use. Scoffers, Leitzonim, they make fun of everything. What would they say? <coughs> Sarah is pregnant. Why is Sarah Imenu pregnant? Because she had a physical relationship with Avimelech. Remember the story of Avimelech? Avimelech kidnapped Sarah, became sick, but he had a relationship with her. So it must be him who's the father. Why? Because she lived for years and years and years with Avraham. She never had children. Now she was one night with Avimelech and she had a child. It must be that she is the mother of of um, Yitzchak, but that Abraham is not the father of Yitzchak. What happened? That Hashem decided he was going to create a situation that Isaac looks exactly like Abraham. As he's getting older, 
His face is an image of his father's face. I don't know how Avimelech looked, but maybe Avimelech had a big nose and Avram had a small nose. Maybe Avimelech had brown eyes and Avram had blue eyes. I've got no idea. I can't explain this. I'm just telling you what Chazal say, quoted here in Rashi. That Avimelech looked one way, Avram looked another way, and if you looked at Yitzchak and you would say, whose child is Yitzchak? You would immediately answer, Avraham, not Avimelech. That's why the Pasuk says, Avraham hoilides Yitzchak, in response to the scoffers. You hear this Rashi? So what's Rashi telling us? Rashi is telling us, really, don't take notice of people who are cynics. Rashi wants to inform us that the Pasuk contains a Musa lesson. By the way, Rashi wasn't a Musa. Rashi was somebody who just wanted to give you pshat in the posuk. He wants to explain the posuk in such a way that we can easily understand it. You know that the Rashbam was his grandson. Do you know, did you know the Rashbam was his grandson? The Rashbam also wrote a parish on Chumish. And in one of the places in the parish on Chumish, he writes that he had a long discussion with his grandfather. Now think about it. Rashi died... In the year 1105, he was born in 1040. So we must imagine that the Rashbam was born roughly 40 years, maybe more, after Rashi. Which means that the time that Rashbam had to speak and have a serious conversation with Rashi was very limited. Maybe from the age of, let's say, 15 to the age of 25. I'm being very generous here. It may only have been from the age of 15 to the age of 20. He had the following conversation with Rashi. He said to Rashi, you know, you wrote a parish on Chumash. And your purpose was to write a parish on Chumash that was pure pshat. Nothing else. But it's not pure pshat. Very often you digress and you include pieces of information which are chazals that are not necessarily the pshat. Not the literal understanding. If your purpose was to write such a parish, you should have written a different parish and you should have written a commentary that was just pshat. And the Rashbam writes that his grandfather agreed with him and said, if I would have the koyach, I would rewrite the whole parish on the Torah, but now I'm too old, and it's not possible for me to do it anymore. So the Rashbam writes, that's why I wrote my parish on the Torah. Because if I, write, if I want to be Rashi's grandson, I have to do what he intended to do. I'll tell you what's particularly fascinating about that. Because the Rashbam doesn't write anything about his parish on the Gomorrah. <laughs> Anyone here learnt Gomorrah Baba Basra? So Gomorrah Baba Basra, at some point, is no longer Rashi. Or we're not sure that the Rashi on Baba Basra is actually Rashi. So what do we do? We include the Rashbam. Guess what? The Rashbam is much longer than Rashi. <laughs> so, go figure, right? When it came to Chumash, the Rashbam writes this very brief commentary. When it came to the Gemara, he wrote this expanded commentary. just shows you, Rashi had his purpose. We've got to believe that there's some level of Ruach HaKodesh operating when Rashi writes his parish on the Torah. And incidentally, if you try and track Rashi on the Torah with Rashi on Gemara, if you try and... Do a comparative study. I don't know if it's ever been done. There's a subject for a good PhD. Try and match up Rashi in the Torah and Rashi on Gemara. You'd think they were two different authors. The, complete, the style is completely different. Rashi on the Gemara is about Pshat. To the extent that very often when Tosfos ask a kasha on Rashi in the Gemara, you think... Yeah, it's the most obvious question in the world. Why would Rashi have gone with this pshat? You know, the great defender of Rashi was the Pnei Yehoshua. The Pnei Yehoshua was the rabbi in Frankfurt. He died in the 1750s. He didn't have an easy time. The community in Frankfurt was not an easy community. He got himself involved in the fight between Rabbi Yaakov Emden and Rabbi Yonas and Ebershitz. <laughs> Can you imagine? He's the Godel Hador and he got fired. They got rid of him. And he went to Metz, and there were people in the community who were his great defenders, and they said, no, it's not right, you, you mustn't do that. You can't fire somebody as great as the Pnei Yeshua. And they sent, they 
obviously they got rid of that board, they elected a new board of management, and they asked the Pnei Yeshua to come back. And the Pnei Yeshua came back, but on the way he died. He's buried in Frankfurt. I've been to his kever in Frankfurt. The Pnei Yeshua was Rashi's great defender. And very often the answer he gives is, Rashi is using the simplest route, like uh, if you're using ways, the simplest route to get to a pshat in the Gemara is this. It's true that if you compare it to a Gemara somewhere else, you might have a problem. But within that Gemara, the simplest pshat is that Rashi in the Gemara is the simplest pshat. Rashi on Chumish is not the simplest pshat. Very often, if you want the simplest pshat, you don't go to Rashi. You go to Ibn Ezra. You go to Rashbam. Because they will come to you with a pshat in the words, the actual understanding of the words. Rashi takes a chazal, and to the extent that it's almost when we read the Torah, that we're not reading the Torah anymore. We're reading Rashi's version of the Torah. That's how ingrained it has become into our understanding of the narratives and even the halacha in the Torah. That it's Rashi's version that is so pervasive. Rashi here does something which somebody who is giving pshat doesn't normally do. He goes beyond that. He says there's a Musa lesson here. Leitzone hadoir. Don't be one of the Leitzone hadoir. The Ramban has a different pshat. And I'm not going to go into the Ramban. I've translated it for you. But I know I'm on limited time here. I'm not watching the time. But I know I'm on limited time. So I'm not going to go into the Ramban. But you've got the source sheet you can take a look at the Ramban. He has a different understanding of why there's a repetition in the first posuk. The only point I want to raise is that the Ramban and Rashi are both addressing the same issue, which is, why should there be a repetition? Why should there be a repetition in a posuk in the Torah? If it already said Avram, Ben Yitzchok Ben Avram, it doesn't need to say Avram Holidus Yitzchok. But now let's look at where Rashi got his pshat. So Gemara and Baba Metzia. You learn Baba Metzia. Baba Metzia is, is a, a very important Mesechta. We learned it in Yeshiva. I'm not sure if we learned this bit. But in Daf Pei Zayin, Omad Aleph, it says as follows. Batoi Meh Sora. Sora said. Mi Mileil Lavram he Niko Bonim. Sora ki Yoladati Vein Liz Kunov. Said Sora. Who would have said to Avram that Sarah should nurse sons? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. In response to her having given birth to a child, to a boy, Yitzchak, she comments, who would have ever believed that that which was said to Avram, that Sarah would nurse sons, that that could ever happen? Says the Gemara, asking a very good question. Bonim? In the plural? How many sons did Yitzchok, did Sarah have? One, and only one. So what does it say, Bonim, in the Posuk? It should say, Ben, in the Posuk. That's the question of the Gemara. Kama Bonim eniko Sarah? How many sons did Sarah nurse? Omar Reb Levi. I'm very fond of Reb Levi, because I'm a Levi. Omar Reb Levi. Here is a story that is beyond unbelievable. It's one of those narratives which when Chazal say it, you could say, oh, this is just incredible. Avram Avinu made a massive party. All the nations of the world, I'm talking about all the, obviously, the local people there who lived in that area, they made fun of him. They ridiculed Avram Avinu. They found, had a foundling that they found somewhere on the street. They brought him home and they say, Hey guys, this is our baby. That's the story. That's how they're presenting it. They are such fakers and such con men, con artists, this Avram and Sora, that they're bringing this foundling home and they are turning the foundling into their child. 
They're making a su'uda, a feast, to celebrate it. Me'os Avram Avinu, what did he do? Halach v'zimen kogadoy lehadar. He invited all the great people of the generation. V'sare me'inu zimna es neshoiseim. And Sarah invited all their wives. V'chal achas v'achas evio bona ima. Umenikta loy hevio. They decided to play a trick. What was the trick? The trick was they brought their children with them, but they didn't bring their wet nurses with them to the party. So what's going to happen? They're going to be crying. The baby's going to be crying. They're going to say, oh, what are we going to do? We need to have the baby fed. Sarah had an incredible miracle. Her breasts opened up like two wellsprings. And she nursed every single one of those babies. Now you can't nurse a baby if you're not a mother. You know, I'm not, I, I don't know, I'm not a doctor. But I think it's fair to say you, if you're not a mother, that it's not going to be possible to do that. It was a miracle. Reminds me of a fantastic story I once heard. You know that there was a famous Rebbe before the Second World War, in the interwar years, called the Ostrov Rebbe. Rebbe Chil Meir Halevi Halshtuk, his name was. He was an unbelievable Talmud Chochem, an incredibly spiritual man. He said he was a miracle worker. People would come from all over Poland to Ostrov, and they would ask him for brachas, and the thing is that his father was a very ordinary fellow. He wasn't a great mayuchus. He wasn't descended from great rabbis. And one, every year they used to have a meeting of all the rebbes in Poland. One year, the rebbes they weren't being very nice. They decided, you know, they always opened the meeting. Every rebbe said a dva Every one of them would say some, you know, explanation, commentary on the parish of the Torah. And they decided among each other that they're going to say, each one of them is going to say something from their father, from their grandfather, in their name. So they're going to embarrass the Ostrov Tzarebbe. Because they were a bit jealous of the fact that he was getting all this attention and he didn't come from anything too great. So he went round the table and each one of them said, I heard a vote from my father, I heard a vote from my grandfather, etc., they come to Ostrov Tzarebbe. He said, I want to tell you, I heard something from my father. That fresh black bread is better than stale challah. <laughs> you think you're going to trick someone. But if that person is a man of God, you're not going to be able to outsmart them. Because God is always going to defend them. And they're going to come out flying, with flying colors. Avraham Avinu, you're trying to shame Avraham Avinu? By bringing all your babies, you're trying to shame Sarah Imenu by bringing all your babies. Don't think that that's going to work. The niftuchu dadeho tishne mayonois veinika eskulom. Vayadayin hoyumaranin baomrim. They still went ahead and said, Im Sarah, Im Sarah habastishim shona teleid. Yes, maybe it's true that Sarah had a child. And therefore, she's able to feed all the babies. Avram ben Meir Shana Yoilit. Avram Avinu, at the age of 100, should be able to have a child. Miyad Nepach cluster ponim shall Yitzchok the Nidme la Avraham, says the Gemara. And this is where the source is. Immediately, the face of Isaac changed to look exactly like that of Avraham. Therefore, they couldn't say that anymore. So the actual problem that the Posuk, uh, that this Gemara is dealing with, has nothing whatsoever to do with the repetition. But what Rashi has done is he's engineered an answer out of this that deals with the problem of Avraham Hoyli Des Yitzchak. What was that problem? The problem is that the Posuk repeats itself. And the fact that the Posuk repeats itself makes no sense. Therefore, this Gemara comes, this Chazal comes in very handy. Asks Reb Chaim Shmulevitz, the next piece here, a very, 
Very good question. Just to bring this whole thing back round, Reb Chaim Shmulevitz was the Rosh Hashiva of Mir. Reb Chaim Shmulevitz says, what a stupid comment to make. Avraham Avinu had children, didn't he? Avraham Avinu had Yishmael, and he had Bnei Keturah. It could have been later, but he had, he had Bnei. This was somebody who was proven that he could have children. So what exactly do these scoffers say when they're suggesting, okay, it's Soros, but it could have been Avimelech's. What were they saying? Says Reb Chaim Shulevitz, here it's in a Hebrew version. Of the Litzone Hador Frek Kakashis. Which means, don't try and understand people who are Litzone Hador. They don't make sense. It doesn't take too much questioning to undermine their reasoning. Another Musr that we can learn from this piece, this Rashi, this repetition in the Pasuk. Reb Chaim Shmulevitz wants to tell us that this entire episode makes no sense. It doesn't have rhyme nor reason. And yet, we have to try and offer a defense. We have to try and present ourselves in the best possible way, even if those who are trying to undermine us don't have an argument that holds any water. That is the message of Reb Chaim Shulevitz. I'm going to look at one more piece and then we'll close. I'm going to look at the piece from... Actually, two more. I'm going to look at Rav Shach and I'm going to look at Rav Tzodek HaKoyim. Rav Shach says, and makes a very interesting point. His point, Rav Eloza Menachem Man Shach, was the Rosh Hashiva of Ponovish. He lived till over the age of 100. Um, he's somebody who I went to visit on a number of occasions with my father, with my Rosh Hashiva. He was one of the great Rosh Hashivas after the Second World War in Eretz Yisrael. He became a Magid Shir initially at Ponovish, and eventually he became not just the Rosh Hashiva, but he was considered to be the Moran, the great rabbi of the generation, guiding people, not just in terms of how they learn, but also in terms of how to lead their lives. He was an incredible person with an intuitive understanding of human nature. He was an electrifying Magid Shir, absolutely electrifying. Every year, he would give the introductory Shir to the Yarche Kala in Ponovish. Now, you have to understand, the man was five foot two, five foot three, he was tiny, and he could barely walk at least by the time I knew him, he walked very, very slowly. And he was quite difficult to understand. Um, I think he spent many of his years smoking and he had a very deep, gravelly voice. And he would get up and you'd think to yourself, what is this tired little old man going to do in front of an audience that was so packed you couldn't fit in. There were people standing and hanging so that they wouldn't fall down to hear the words of the Rosh Hashiva. And he'd begin speaking, and he became like a young man. You can watch it on YouTube. You can see this old man suddenly transformed as he gave a shear. It was like looking at a different person. You could close your eyes and imagine that this was a man of 40, 50 speaking with clarity and with excitement, with passion. That is the power of Torah. You know, you can watch, I don't know if it's still on YouTube, there was a video that was at a, for a time going around of him having a discussion with a bunch of Bochrim at the front of the Beis Medrash in Ponovish, shouting at them and they're shouting back at him about some, I'm sure, very obscure point in the Gemara that they were disagreeing about. And they're gesticulating, and they're shouting, and they're energized. And you think to yourself, really? But he gave such an excitement in the study of Torah. The study of Torah is not just something which is academic. It's not just scholarship. Studying Torah is meaningful. When you study Torah, it should enliven you. It should give you energy, and it does. 
Listen to what Rav Shach has to say about this particular episode. Let's understand one important aspect of the personalities of Avraham, Abraham, and Yitzchak, Isaac. Two completely different, you couldn't have two more different people. Ze chesed, ze gevura. Can't live in the same person, it's impossible. What's chesed? Kindness, compassion, considerate. What's gevura? Strength. In a sense, it's inflexibility. It's the power to do things when everything militates against it. That's gevura. Chesed is you always see the other point of view. Right? You're always willing to concede. You're less important than the other person because you want to give. You're giving. Chesed and gevura. For example, we don't see any mention in the Torah. And by omission, we can learn things. There's no mention in the Torah that Yitzchak Avinu ever entertained guests. Does that mean he never had guests? No. Probably had guests, but we've got no idea. But that's not a central theme of Yitzchak. It's never mentioned. Nor do we ever see that he educated anybody in what it means to be somebody who worships God. What do we mean by that? In a world of polytheists, people believe in many gods, Avram Avinu was a beacon, was a lighthouse of monotheism. He introduced the concept of monotheism, and it was totally self-generated. No one taught him. He became a monotheist, and he educated others to be monotheists. Did Yitzchok do that? No, we have no evidence that Yitzchok ever educated anyone to believe in Hashem, like Avram, his father. His entire being, every aspect of his life, was to uh, totally be machnia himself, to allow himself to be in the shadow of God and in the service of God and to do the will of God. Give a good example is the Akeda. We always talk about the Akeda as a test of Abraham. But there's quite a bit of literature to say in, in the commentaries, that Yitzchak, of course, was also tested. It was a different type of test. And in this respect, in the respect of giving himself over, allowing himself to be tied to the altar, and he knew what was going to happen. There's a big knife there, a ma'acheles. There's a massive machete that Avram Avinu is holding in his hand. What do you think you're going to do with it? He knew, and he allowed himself to be tied to the altar. Gives himself over completely. That's the nature of Yitzchak. At its very core, at its very root, there's no difference really between Avraham Avinu and Yitzchak Avinu. They are one and the same. Ela Hashlamano. Do you know what it is? It completes it. It is a completion. It's the culmination of what Avraham Avinu is about. Yitzchak is not a contradiction. He somehow dovetails with who Avraham Avinu is. When Avraham Avinu was about to do the Akeda, about to do the slaughter of his son Isaac, God says to him, Now I know that you are someone who fears God. We know that the whole concept of what it means to be an Av, a patriarch, a forefather of the Jewish people began then, and that each one stands on the shoulder of the next. It's an incredible image if you want to have a good image. The image of the Ovois not being in and of themselves. It starts with Avram Avinu, and the next one is like he got a, a, a leg up, and now he's standing on his father's shoulders, and the next one is Yaakov, and he's standing on his father's shoulders, like a giant pyramid of Ovois. That's what the Jewish people is. Says Rav Shach, if you look at the Kliyokar, he says the word Hoylid gave birth to, it's an odd word, 
Because first we say Yitzchok ben Avram. What does it mean, Avram holid es Yitzchok? He gave birth to him. He did more than give birth to him. He created him. He formed him. He, he allowed for the possibility of Yitzchak's existence. Ma'ashel loshen ben. It's a better way of expressing that idea than the word ben. The difference between Yishmael and Avram is, look at the posuk, because last week's Sedra had something about Yishmael. What does it say there? Look at the posuk. Yishmael ben Avram ashe yolda hagar. Who does he take after? Whose shoulders does Yishmael stand on top of? Hagar. Whose shoulders does Yitzchak stand on? Avraham. It's giving over a message, a powerful message. Where do we draw our character from? Who are we really? Incredible lesson for us. You know, people often ask me, I live in America. Maybe you can tell from my accent. <laughs> People ask me, do you miss England? Good question, right? So I say, I miss the donuts in Grudzinski, <laughs> which I now understand starting tomorrow will once again be available in Golders Green. They've been available in Edgware all this time. But that's not enough to justify my Englishness. <laughs> the fact that I can recite word for word Episodes of Monty Python <laughs> doesn't make me English. I wouldn't want to say England hoilid as pinny. Mm. I'd like to say that my father, Rab Abba, hoilid as pinny. And he was Rab Yosef Tzvi hoilid as Abba. That's a powerful idea. Who am I? Yishmael is Hogar's production. Avraham produced Yitzchak. Yitzchak is Avraham's production. Continues Rav Shach. Rak shebechitzonius nira she'en keshe b'neihem. So externally you could say they don't particularly behave the same. They don't have the same character. The Yitzchak shechaser kabiyocha midas hanesinas lezulas doy me yoyse leplishtim shepolshim laacherim. Maybe he looks different because he's more like the plishtim. He likes Monty Python, perhaps, or the plishtim version of Monty Python. And Avram, after all, came from Urkastim. He spent some time in Choron. Maybe he's more of an Urkastim type. I don't know what the particular uh, comedian that he liked was. I've got no idea. That's not who Yitzchak was. It's not who Avram was. At their essence, at their core, at their shayrish, Avraham was the great monotheist who's willing to do the Akedah. And Yitzchak Avinu is the great monotheist who may externally appear different, who's willing to go on the Mizbeach of the Akedah. Yitzchak ben Avram just tells you a piece of information Yitzchak is the son of Avraham. That's just a piece of information. It's genetics. Avraham hoilid es Yitzchak. You want to know who Yitzchak is? Every single fiber of his being was Yitzchak. We have to turn the page here. So he... Is not a child of Yitzchok. Yaakov is a child of Yitzchok. Why? Because Esau took on all the characteristics of the Plishtim and of the Canaanim. He became part of the culture of the country in which he grew up. Yaakov Avinu, 64 years, he's in the Oihel, he's in the tent, he's studying Torah. Another 14 years in the Yeshiva of Shem and Eber. Somebody asked me a few weeks ago, we're learning. Meseches Brochus in my shul. Every Shabbos we have a Gemara here before, before davening. Somebody asked me, what did they learn in the Yeshiva of Shem and Eber? He was like, I wouldn't say making fun. He wasn't from the Leitzone Hador. He wasn't from the pastors either who were coming to Mir Yeshiva. He just was curious. What did they learn? They didn't learn Gemara Brochus. So what are you talking about? 
They learned how to connect to Hashem. They learned how to connect to Hashem. Do I know what they learned? I don't really know what they learned. Could be they sat and davened all day. He wasn't happy with that. What do you mean they davened all day? So maybe they sat and davened. Maybe they learned Sheva Mitzvah Bnei Noach in the morning, like a Musa Seder for half an hour. And the rest of the day, they davened. What's wrong with that? He said, do you have a Makair for this? I said, yes. Because I watched how my Rosh Hashivas davened when I was in Yeshiva. And I can tell you that if they would have had a chance, if it wouldn't say Vashinam Tom Levanecha Vadibar Tabon, they would have sat and davened all day. Yaakov Avinu is someone who draws from the essence of Yitzchak and gives it over to his Shvatim. Esav, he's like one of the Plishtim, just the same as everybody else. I want to learn one last piece here, which is so beautiful. And the reason I like it is because it ends up with us having to say thank you, Hashem. This is a piece from Reb Tzodek HaKoyim. I translated it. I'm sure it's a very poor translation. But the best that I could do, I did. And if I made any mistakes, they're mine, not Reb Tzodek's, okay? Man is inherently very curious. And we want to reveal everything, right? Everybody wants to know everything about everything. And we're willing to climb hills and to dive into the abyss and to go into mines and caves. But there's one thing that people really shy away from. If you want to ask somebody, what's the most boring subject on the planet? And something that you're not going to see articles in The Economist about, or in The Times, or in Time magazine, or in any of the major publications. Nobody is writing long pieces for the uh, media about God. Interesting. Everything you want to know, by the way, this week, you want to know about climate change, open any newspaper. A dozen pages about climate change. Imagine I would have an international conference about God. Do you think they'd devote a paragraph to it? I highly doubt it. Nobody wants to know about it. Theology is a boring subject. We don't want to know about God. Even people who are religious don't want to know too much about God. They love the detail of halacha. You know, what time does Shabbos start? No, this week is a brilliant week because we change the clocks. Now Shabbos comes in an hour early. That's what we're busy with. What about what Hashem wants from us? What about what Hashem does for us? How many people think about that? It's not a thing that we want to think too deeply about. It says Reb Tzodek HaKoyen, the one detail that we're not willing to delve into and observe in any great depth is to know the real meaning of life and to what he calls Lisponein lahakir es mashmo es achayim lahakir es ha'odoin shel habira. I translated it here as the master of the citadel, right? Especially because there are many people who believe in him and pray to him. And it's particularly because those who don't believe in him don't want to find out too much about Hashem. Because if they find out too much about Hashem, it may mean they need to change their lives. I heard this story many, many years ago. There was a, a rabbi called Rabbi Yankel Galinsky. Anybody here remember Bianco Galinsky? He was a Rosh Hashiva in Itri. Later on, he had a coil in Bnei Brak. He originally learned in Navardic Yeshiva. The Moedica, he had an absolute, he was a fantastic storyteller. He told the following story. I'll never forget it. He said he was in a taxi and he got talking to the taxi driver. And the taxi driver says to him, you know, I know rabbis like stories. I want to tell you a story. So when, after I went to the army, this taxi driver was in his 30s or 40s, so after I went to the army, I went on a year off. You know, Israelis, they go on a year off. And he said, I went to the jungle with a friend of mine. And we're walking through the jungle, and I think it was in India, and suddenly a boa constrictor, huge snake, slithers from a tree and wraps itself around my friend, and he's biting my friend and strangling, you know, choking the air out of my friend. And he's trying to breathe and I'm hitting it with my stick. And I'm trying to get the snake to come off and nothing's happening. And my friend with his last breath, ah, ah, he's dying, he says, Shema Yisrael. And the snake unwraps itself and goes back up the tree. It's 
a miracle, Rabbi. An unbelievable miracle. You know, my friend, you probably know him. He says his name, he didn't know him. He says he went, he became very religious, and he got married, and he's got 14 children, and he studied in Kolel. It changed his life. Incredible story. So Rianka Galinsky says, I'll tell you something, I've heard stories. I've never heard such an amazing story. What a fantastic story. He said, and why didn't you become a Baal Tshuva? He said, me? It didn't happen to me. <laughs> That's how we are, right? If you examine yourself, that's how you are. It didn't happen to me. It happened to someone else. And if I know about too much about what happened to someone else, it might be me. I, 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 I'm, I'm going to have to take on all the things that they take on. Says Reb Tzodok HaKoyen, we must learn from this story of those who were the Leitzone Hadoir, of the miracle of Yitzchak's birth, and they found reasons to doubt it. What's Rashi telling us? What's the Gemara telling us? The people could see something with their eyes. Sora Imenu is 90 years old. She has a baby. Mazel tov. Avram Avinu is 100 years old. He becomes a father of a new baby. Mazel tov. No, it's not her baby. It's not his baby. It's a mistake. They found it. It's Avimelech. It's some other reason. It's got nothing to do with miracles. It's definitely got nothing to do with God. Says the Reb Tzodek HaKoyen, you know what we learn from this story? In every generation there's going to be Leitzonei Hadoir. And in every generation there's going to be re- people who are going to find reasons to undermine that little bit of faith that you may get from a story. But we, Ach Oleinu Lahabit Be'enayim Emuniyois. We can't be like the late Sonei Hadoir. That's what Rashi wants us to hear. We have to look at everything with enaim emunios, with believing eyes, with eyes of faith. We must observe and see the greatness of the Creator and give thanks to Him. Al nisecha shebechol yoin imonu. On the miracles that we have every single day of our lives. The scoffers are there to remind us how important it is to say, thank you, Hashem. Thank you.